Welcome to Dark Times and Mercy, featuring John Grisham and Ian Rankin, a program in the all-virtual 2021 Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Jane Kulo, director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. If you haven't read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from our bookseller for this event, New Dominion Bookshop, please visit vabook.org, where you can also explore our full schedule and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org give. We greatly appreciate the support of our, spons our sponsor for this event, the UVA Gamma Knife Center, and we appreciate the help of our community partners in sharing this event. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. John Grisham, author of A Time for Mercy, has written 35 novels, a work of nonfiction, a collection of stories, and six novels for young readers. He is a longtime member of the board of directors for The Innocence Project. Ian Rankin is the author of A Song for the Dark Times and dozens of other best-selling novels, plays, teleplays, and more. He has received numerous awards in recognition of his work, including the Top Crime Writers Award from many countries and an OBE for Surfaces to Literature. In their newest books, John and Ian offer stories in which their longtime characters, Jake Brigance and John Rebus, face new challenges. John and Ian, thank you for joining us. Tell us more. <laughs> thank you, Jane. And uh, Ian, since you're on my turf, I'm here in Virginia, I say welcome to, uh, to Virginia, to the book festival. And uh, we tried to get you here last year. COVID intervened. We tried again this year, and so it intervened again. We're virtual. Uh, you got to promise that next year in 2022, you'll be here live and in person, okay? Well, as long as there's no new pandemic, uh, I'll be there. And I want to come to Edinburgh. You have a great book festival there, right? We do. Um, and again, last year it had to be virtual only. So um, uh, in some ways that made it easier because, you know, you could be there, John, without getting out of your slippers uh, or leaving your house. Um, this year, they're hoping that it will be partly virtual and partly real. Um, so again, we're just hoping that everybody's been vaccinated by then and travel is okay. Um, readers are desperate, as you know, they're desperate for books and they're desperate for book festivals. They want to keep keeping up that conversation with their favorite authors. We actually met at a book festival in Lyon, France about five years ago. Uh, wonderful, probably the best festival in France. And I'm going to ask you, do you do a lot of those European festivals? Yeah, I did. Um, I say did past tense because who knows what Brexit is going to mean to the traveling author. Um, we may have to get visas and things, which we didn't have to do when the UK was part of the European Union. Yeah, that festival, Quai de Polar uh, in Lyon, is one of, certainly one of the best, one of the best organized, one of the biggest. I didn't think I would miss it, John. I'm, I'm a bit of a homebody. I, I like, you know, walking to my local bar, walking to my local bookstore, sitting around in my home, um, jumping on planes, trains and into automobiles, going all around the world was getting kind of tiring as I'm getting older. Um, but I do miss it. I miss uh, the travel. I miss meeting readers. Um, I miss meeting other authors. And just as you and I did, we had five minutes backstage, you know, when we just sort of met each other. But who knows where it leads? And in our case, it leads to this. It leads to us at last having a conversation where I get to ask you all the questions I've always wanted to ask you. You know, for, for 20 years, uh, I didn't tour at all uh, from, I don't know, from the mid 1990s after the first wave of books and movies and life got kind of crazy. And I realized I didn't have to tour. I could stay at home and write books and, and, and they would sell without me, you know, being on the planes, trains and all, going everywhere. Uh, and I, I got spoiled to just becoming almost a recluse and, uh, and the books were still selling. So I, I, I thought life was good. A few years ago, I was talking to Stephen King, a, a good friend of mine, a guy I really respect. And we were talking about um, book selling and booksellers and, and the reading public and, and how difficult it is for uh, so many booksellers uh, to survive. And this, you know, this is before COVID. And so we both decided to start touring some more and to hit the road. 
And I did it uh, three or four years ago with a book called Camino Island. It was a, a non-legal thriller and went to about 25 different bookstores and I, I, I realized how much I enjoy going to great bookstores just as a customer, but also to meet the booksellers, to meet a lot of the fans, to meet the people who are buying the books. And I've been to more book festivals. Uh, it's fun meeting uh, the other writers uh, as we met and hanging out with them. And you know, I, I think once, once we all get vaccinated and once this thing does go away you're going to see a lot of writers very eager to hit the road again and get out and and, uh, and see the bookstores and meet the booksellers sure and i mean it was the bookstores and in particular in the usa were very important to me in my early years as an author every small town in america seemed to have a specialist mystery bookstore passionate uh, passionate sellers of books and passionate readers of books and those were my first champions. They, you know, I, I was writing books about Edinburgh, Scotland, a place many of them didn't know or hadn't been to. Um, but they just loved the, the 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 structure of the crime novel. They loved the character of Rebus. Um, and not word of mouth, booksellers saying to people, oh, if you like Michael Connolly, you might like Ian Rankin. Why don't you give him a try? That kind of thing was hugely important. And it saddens me a little bit that now when I come to the States on tour, a lot of those bookstores are no longer there. Um, the physical bookstores the, the, uh, are no longer there. Um, the internet has taken over uh, in a lot of cases. Um, the owners have retired and can't find anybody else to take it on. Um, it's been a passion for them, but you know, when they go, they can't always find another young, passionate person to take on the store. So that's slightly frustrating. But as you say, when, the, in, when the good independent bookstores are still with us, please, let's keep them going. And certainly during the the past year uh, in Edinburgh, where we've had this pandemic and a lot of the bookstores have had to be closed, physically shut, the local population have kept them going. So you you know, you can order on the phone, you can pay with your credit card on the phone, then you go along and it's almost like a furtive experience. You knock on the door and the bookseller opens the door and hands you the paper bag with your book in it and off you go back home to read it or else they deliver the books by bicycle in some cases, they'll actually deliver to your door and leave them at the door and phone you and say it's sitting on your doorstep. People are just hungry for books and, and uh, publishers and booksellers have found ways to adapt very quickly. And the same with festivals, book festivals have found a way to adapt to still keep providing something for readers who just want that connection. Yeah, people, people what we're seeing here, and I, I think it's probably true over there too, people have they're stuck at home. They have more time to read. Uh, they, they want the books. The, the books are a, a connection to the life they remember recently, the, the, the normal life. Books are a connection to um, their past. Uh, you, know, you know, you and I are lucky. We sell a lot of books and we're, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how um, attached some readers get to to our books and to our characters. And, and that's it's very gratifying. And, to, and during the pandemic, you know, you, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of book buyers and booksellers who are really um, eager to get the books and get them published. I, the, we sold more books last year in the U.S. than the year before. Uh, our book sales are pretty strong. Most of our bookstores here have uh, managed to hang on. Some have closed, a few of them. Uh, but doing the same thing, curbside service, uh, limited browsing indoors, home delivery, you name it. Early mm -hmm. in, the, in the pandemic uh, over here, uh, Amazon, who now sells two thirds of all books in this country, uh, Amazon um, downgraded the importance of uh, books behind medicine and groceries. But you know they, they had they had to prioritize, and so books got knocked down a notch, and you couldn't get them as fast. And people, when that happened, people started calling the local bookstores again. And you know, hey, we, we want these books. We don't really care what the price is, uh, but you know, can we come get the books? And so overall, it's been it's been, uh, I can't say a boom for us, but certainly it's, the, the business has stayed there. So the question for you as a writer, because um, I get asked this question every week, you know, people want to know, how, is it, how has it impacted you? Well, I mean, like you, I had a book that was published during uh, the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you were writing your book during the pandemic, John, you can maybe tell me that after, but uh, it was written. I mean, the latest Rebus novel was written during the pandemic. Um, and luckily, I decided to set it in the summer of 2019, because it had been set in the summer of 2020. It would have been a very different book 
the crime would have been solved by Zoom uh, because Rebus couldn't travel around Scotland the way he does in the book. Um, and, you know, the, the, the lockdown in some ways was great for me. I'd just done all the research for the book. I'd been on a road trip all around Scotland to the places where it was going to be set. And then lockdown came along and I just sat in this very room. This is my office. Uh, and I sat in this very room and just wrote. And, and writing for me was uh, an escape. It was like I was tunneling out of the pandemic um, into a world that made sense and a world that I could control. Um, and I found the writing was just very refreshing. And, you know, a lot of it, as you've been suggesting, as a, as a successful writer, sometimes you don't always get the amount of time to write that you would like. You're too busy doing other things. You're traveling, you're, on, you're doing interviews, et cetera, et cetera. There was none of that. I mean, yeah. as you've said, the, the event with you in Virginia last March was the first event of mine to be canceled uh, because of the pandemic. And then everything after that got canceled. No more tours, no interviews, no nothing. So I just sat in this room and wrote and it was it was glorious. It was like being a kid again in my bedroom when I was growing up and I just sat and wrote song lyrics and poems and short stories for the sheer joy of it. And the joy was ignoring the outside world yeah. and creating a world that actually made sense um, and a world that would have a happy ending, um, such as you can have in crime fiction. Um, but yeah, I mean, what about you? What about publishing? Um, I mean, did you write the book during the during, uh, during lockdown? Yeah, I was during. But I started book. I started book every January uh, oh. with the goal of finishing uh, by the first of July. So I was. Uh, I get a lot of work done this time of the year: January, February, March. Those are great months um, to, because you know obviously you can't get outdoors, you can't travel that much, you don't want to travel that much, and um, that's just been our our cycle for twenty five years. So you know. I, kind of go in the bunker January, February, March, and start coming out a little bit in April as the weather gets nicer. So when the pandemic hit a year ago, so today is, yeah, you know, February, March, when it really hit, uh, suddenly I, you know, I was in the middle of the book. The book got thicker because I had more time to write, which is not always a good thing. But uh, I had, uh, in, in the spring of last year, I had, um, uh, I was going back to Lyon, France. I had that booked. I was going to a, a book festival in, the UK, several book festivals around the US, all that got all that got canceled, you know, and so suddenly you're stuck at home and um, really nothing to do. The, the, the writing was, it has always been an escape for me. It's always, I go to my, I go to my office at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, with a strong cup of coffee, five days a week, sometimes six, and, and there's nothing else in the office but me and the, you know, the big screen, the big desktop. And and um, I just, I still treasure those moments. And after, you know, doing this for 30 years, it's still, uh, I did it this morning. It's a lot of fun to just, to go create, to go work on the novel, to go plot the next chapter, to go, you, to, to see the characters again. And that is, all, has always been an escape. So I'm lucky to have that. Initially, when, when it hit last year, the things were so frightening and so chaotic on so many different fronts. We'd never lived through this before. It was truly historic. Um, I did find it hard to concentrate on reading. Mm. Uh, I, I've always got two or three books going, you know, different types of books, and, and I read every night, and I, 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 I have always loved that. Uh, but for a while, it took me a, 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 some time to get beyond the distractions of the 24-7 news cycle, the next bad story. And I, but I got over that, and uh, so I've, I've been reading a tremendous amount uh, in the past year, so that's been... That's been a, a blessing. We, my, my wife and I are big college basketball fans. We live here in Charlottesville and, and we follow the teams here and um, she's from North Carolina. So she's a big, so anyway, we go to a lot of college basketball games. And uh, in, in March last year, um, suddenly March Madness, our big college tournament, which is the biggest sports tournament in America was canceled for the first time ever. And it was really a shock to to fans because, you know, it's like your premier league. It's just what we live for. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I thought, well, you know, I've, I've got some time on my hand coming up pretty soon when I finish the legal thriller. I've always wanted to write a book about college basketball, a novel. And so I started that in uh, July, August, really I, I sort of out of boredom, <laughs> had nothing else to do for the fall. And I finished that and that book comes out in a couple of months. So yeah, long winded answer to your question. I've had a lot of time to, a lot more time to write. I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing, but I did, I did write more words last year 
uh, in 12 months of 2020 than any other year that I've been writing. So uh, I'd like to back off of that a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think I did the same because I finished um, the, the Rebus novel sort of May, June and was immediately approached by a publisher with a project to finish a novel that had been started by a, a writer I really admire who died a few years ago, a Scottish writer called William McIlvanny. And he'd left an unfinished book, a barely started book, to be honest with you. And he said, look, would you finish it? It was featuring his detective. He'd been a big influence on me in my early days. So I took that on. So, you know, in, in 2020, I ended up writing two books, which is, you know, one and a half more than I would normally write in a year. Um, and did other projects on top of that. And I've started something else now and there's something else waiting to go after that. Yeah, as you say, what else are you going to do? Let me take you back though, because I do want, before we run out of time, I do want to get some of these questions and that I've always wanted to ask you. Um, and one is to do with write about what you know, which if you go to creative writing classes, I don't know if you've ever been to creative writing class, I never have. Um, but if you go to creative writing classes, they say write about what you know, and with your you know, first novel and, and afterwards, you did write about what you what you knew. You were a criminal lawyer. And I just wondered, I mean, two, two things. One is I didn't do that, so we can maybe talk about that later. But were you writing um, before you started that, that novel? I mean, I know it was rejected many, many times, but did you, had you always been writing? Had you been writing as a hobby or did it just suddenly come to you one day, I'm going to, as a criminal lawyer, I'm going to also write a book? Uh, just the opposite. I never dreamed of writing. I never studied creative writing. I never, I never took a class in writing. I'd always been a big reader. Uh, it was not a childhood dream. It was not something I thought about as a student. Uh, I, I was a lawyer. I thought I'd be a lawyer forever. And, um, and, then, and then one day something happened. One day in, in, a, in a matter of a few minutes, uh, something very dramatic happened in my life or something I witnessed. And it, it, I did not realize it at the time, but it would dramatically change my life. And it was uh, this, this very uh, powerful moment in a courtroom in a small Southern town, my courtroom, but the, the courthouse I practiced in. And uh, I, was, I was inspired to start thinking about this, um, this story as seen through the eyes of a young idealistic attorney, kind of like myself, who was dreaming of the big trial, the big courtroom victory that we, you know, what lawyers dream of. And that's how it got started. And after, playing around with this idea for, you know, a few weeks, it became an obsession. And, and I, for, for some reason, on a whim one night, just said, okay, I'm going to see if I can write chapter one. And I, and I started writing in, in longhand on a legal pad. And uh, that's how I started my writing career. Had no idea what I was doing, had never written before, didn't know if I was going to finish, didn't care. Uh, I was busy as a lawyer. I was busy as a politician. My wife was having babies. Life was pretty crazy and life was good. Uh, but that was just, it was, a, it was a secret little hobby for a long time. And then finally finished the first book and got it published and that led to something else. I mean, it was rejected a lot, right? It was rejected a lot. Uh, back then in the mid 1980s, unlike now, you could submit to, long before the internet, you could submit hard copies, believe it or not, uh, to both, editors and to agents. Uh, now I'm told it's all different. It all goes to an agent. You have to have an agent. Uh, and I've had editors say they won't even look at something that doesn't because it's not come from an agent. Uh, but I had, I had uh, a lot of rejections from, from editors and from agents and kept plugging away. Uh, kept, you know, the classic submission rejection back and forth. And I thought it was kind of fun, you know, that people would, would reject my stuff. I wasn't, I wasn't doing this for a living. I wasn't, you know, going to get all depressed over it. And then uh, after 15 or so agents uh, said no, I got the, the first of many wonderful phone calls one morning when I was not expecting anything. An agent from New York called and said he wanted to represent me and the book. And that was a big turning point. So let, 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 let me ask you. What inspired you to pursue a career uh, writing about crime? Um, I, I, I'd always written. I mean, when I was a little kid sitting in my bedroom, I was writing. I was trying to draw comic books, um, strip cartoons, you name it, writing song lyrics for bands that didn't exist. I just always wrote. It was how I made sense of the world. It was enjoyable. Like you, I read a lot. My parents weren't big readers. They were 
blue collar people. They'd left school at 14, 15, got jobs in factories and shops, stores, what have you. Um, there weren't many books in the house, but I just was fascinated by the written word. I was fascinated by storytelling. There was a lovely little library in our uh, town, which Andrew Carnegie, uh, from the same part of the world as me, um, he had instigated this, uh, instituted this, this library, like many others. Um, and, I, you know, it wasn't enough just to read stories. I wanted to write them as well. And that followed me all the way to university and started writing short stories and trying to get them published. Uh, one novel was rejected out of hand by everybody it was sent to. The first Rebus novel eventually was turned down by six or seven publishers, but then picked up by the, the final one on the list. As you say, it was back in the days when you just had the one copy and you would put it in the mailbox and send it off uh, one at a time to publishers. I didn't have an agent. Um, uh, crime, I don't know, because, you know, I, I wasn't that interested in crime fiction as a reader, the mystery novel. My sister, my older sister, was a big fan of Agatha Christie, but I wasn't. I read thrillers, uh, Robert Ludlum, um, I used to love his books. Uh, there was a, a Scots author called um, Alistair MacLean, yeah. who wrote any war thrillers, I loved them, and my dad loved them as well. Um, but I got an idea for a story, um, and I thought the main character might well be a detective. It was a story really about the Jekyll and Hyde nature of Edinburgh, the city where I was living at the time as a student. And um, that was it. And I called him Rebus, which means picture puzzle, because he was solving a picture puzzle. He was solving a puzzle that was being sent to him by someone who was goading him, who was teasing him, uh, not knowing that he would be around <laughs> 30 odd years later, I'd still be writing about this guy, a bit like you with your first book, you know? I mean, somehow you get attached to a character and they, they refuse to let you go. And as long as you can think of things that you want to do with them um, that challenge you and, and make, make sure that the character has growth, um, then I think you, you know, why would you get rid of the character? I mean, I did get rid of Rebus, I bumped him off. I killed him at the end of the first draft of the first book. <laughs> and then in the second draft, for some reason, brought him back. Uh, he's injured, but not killed. Um, that was that was fortunate as it transpires. But you know, after I'd written that book and published it, the first Rebus novel, I went and did a spy novel. I did a thriller. They were none of them. Neither of them was very successful. And then my editor said, "What happened to that guy Rebus? I liked him as a character." And I said, "Yeah, I liked him as well. And I do want to keep writing about Edinburgh, so maybe I'll bring him back." And that was it. Two books, three books, four books, and I just found myself really attached to him. Um, so I didn't know how the police worked. Um, I just made it up mostly. Eventually, I had a network of police friends and, and, and people who would talk to me and answer questions. You will notice, I mean, people out there who've read my books will notice the books end with the perpetrator being arrested, charged, whatever, but before the criminal trial, because right. I have no idea what happens during a criminal trial. Okay, okay. Uh, and so this write about what you know thing, you know, I just go, well, let's just stop there because that's a whole bunch of stuff that I then don't need to know about. Okay, you, you just said you, you don't know about, you didn't know about uh, police procedure, uh, but you, you, your, your, your novels are so uh, authentic when it comes to the cop speak, the cop talk, the cop interactions, the, the paperwork, the procedure, the supervision, the internal affairs. I mean, you can't just... You can't make that up. You have to know that. How'd you learn? I don't want to say it out loud, but you kind of can make it up. I mean, if you if you know your craft, you can persuade the reader that you know what you're talking about. I think sometimes the problem is doing too much research. Often I'll read a book and think, oh, whoa, you have really researched this subject. And you want the reader to know you have researched this subject. And suddenly you're not in the novel anymore. You're, you're having a conversation with the author, not the characters in the book. So the, no, no matter how much research I do, I try and make sure I only maybe use 5% of it so that the reader you know, knows that you've done a little bit, you know, you know, they know you've done it, but they, they're not hearing you say it. They're actually still involved in the storytelling aspect of it. That's why a lot of cops who sometimes give me their novels that they've written, don't, they can't do it. They can't do a, a novel because there's too much of the, the information, the jargon, stuff that goes nowhere, a lot of knocking on doors, asking questions, getting no satisfying answers that don't push the story forwards, because that's what a police investigation is like. And cops who like my books often say they like them because they leave that stuff out. You're aware it's happening somewhere on the periphery, just off the page. People are knocking on doors, 
the stuff happening that isn't leading us any further forward. We're going to stick with these two or three people who are pushing the story forwards. I was going to ask, how, how do cops react to your books? Because I, I know how lawyers react to, to my books. How, how do cops react to your books? Well, you know, I mean, usually people will say to me everywhere I go in the world, oh, we had the guy like Rebus on the force. Or I know a guy who knew a guy who was like Rebus. It's like this, he's like almost like an archetype. I mean, hopefully not a stereotype, but an archetype of this uh, grumpy middle-aged cop who's seen it all and is a bit of a maverick and isn't going to follow the rules. He would not be able to do that these days in the modern Scottish police force. He wouldn't get away with not being a team player, with bending the rules, breaking the rules, being a maverick, going off and doing his own thing. He's always operated more like a private detective right. than a police detective, a, re a realistic police detective. Um, but I like it when cops around the world say, oh, yeah, I knew a guy like him or my dad knew a guy like him. He was in the force. Um, and, and that's always thrilling. But at first, I mean, the, the, I, I've told this story before. I'll keep it short. But when the first research I did, I wrote to the chief of police in Edinburgh and said, will you help me? <laughs> and I was sent a letter that sent me down to a police station to ask these two detectives some questions. But I didn't know that they were investigating a crime that was very similar to the one that was going to be in my book. And so when I laid out the plot to them, I became a suspect. <laughs> they thought I was, I'd done this crime or I was some kind of weird voyeur who had come in here to try and get information or something. So they took all my details down and I became a suspect in a murder inquiry, my first shot at, at research. So after that, John, I did not go near the police for many years until a police detective came to one of my signings and said, I like your books, but you make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And he then became my point of contact and he helped me make fewer mistakes in, in, the, in the rest of my series. I mean, do you, I, I guess you, you know it, right? Yeah, I mean, do you still have to go and ask people? I mean, has, has the legal situation changed so much, the, the way that the, the law is structured in the States? When it comes to the law, uh, it still is very easy because, again, that's what I know. That's what I've done. Uh, you talk about, you know, cops writing books. When I, when I read a, a legal story or a courtroom drama, uh, that's, you know, I'm not sure who the writer is. Within five or ten pages of, of the first chapter, I can tell you if that writer is a lawyer because there's just so many mistakes that, that they make along. You, it's hard to fake some of that stuff. At the same time, just exactly what you said earlier, too much research can kill you. Uh, most lawyers who try to write novels fail because they want to impress you with how much they know about the law. And most of the law is very dull, okay? And, and they, they load you down with terms and procedures and things that you don't really care, that do not advance the story. And, and I have tried to point that out to a few people over the years, it, it doesn't work. Every lawyer uh, thinks he or she can write a novel because, because you see a lot of really fascinating stuff kind of like cops uh, in, in your daily practice, you, you, whether it's white collar, uh, you know, uh, court appointed criminal work, corporate work, whatever. There are a lot of fascinating cases and a lot of fascinating people. And, and that's where I, I get my ideas from. But a lot of lawyers are just, they tend, most lawyers tend to overdo it. And they just write stuff that nobody can read. And most of them are great storytellers, uh, but they cannot, they cannot connect with the reader. So uh, that's, that's what, that's what kills a lot of them. With me, there's a, there's a, there's a fine uh, line you have to kind of walk down when you write courtroom stuff, because most, as I said, most courtroom stuff is pretty dull and it's a real challenge to write a big thick novel about a trial and keep it exciting. You can't have a, you know, a, a, a dramatic confrontation in every chapter. It, it just doesn't work that way. But, but that's, you know, that's, where, that's where being a lawyer really comes in. I also know how to research the law. If I want to research it, I know where to go and find uh, what I need to find. Um, but, you know, as far as police work, I have a lot of FBI guys in my, I have a lot of, I'm not a crime writer, but there's a fair amount of crime in my stuff. And, and, and so I, I'm really on thin ice when I'm talking about police procedure and forensics and, and investigative stuff. And, and, and so I'm always struggling um, I've had a couple of agents over the years in a nice way say, enjoy your books, but boy, you really get it wrong. You better, boy, you really, boy, you really have no idea what you're talking about. And even a couple of retired guys over the years would give me their card and say, look, if you want to, 
you know, for fun, give me a call and I'll walk you through it and tell you how we do it. I'm writing a book right now, uh, the, the next legal thriller that's got you know, a fair amount of crime in it. And the FBI is going to get involved with some really uh, complicated forensics. And I have no clue what I'm going to do. I mean, I'll figure it out. Uh, I'll fake a lot of it, but you, you got to, you got to, you can't fake too much. You got to be fairly accurate. It's true. It's true. Yeah, you know, last year, because we were going to do this thing at the Virginia Festival of the book, um, I reread, um, I'm not going to say I reread all your books, but I reread a fair number of them. I mean, I reread A Time to Kill. Uh, I, I, I thought it just was, is, is prescient the right word? I thought this could, this could be happening right now. Um, because I was looking at America, I was looking at what was happening with the politics in America, with society, with unrest. Uh, with police violence against blacks, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with a, it seemed like a resurgent hard right. Um, and I just thought, wow, it, it just, that book just seems as fresh as the day it was written. Well, it's, you know, it's about racial conflict. And uh, this country, it's race is so complicated here uh, because of our uh, history, uh, mm -hmm. because of, uh, the history is so tortured and complicated. And uh, we've made so much progress in the last 50 years. And then, and then George Floyd happens last summer. And you, you think, how in the world could this happen? Uh, these police shootings have been going on for years, okay? And black people know that. Uh, white people denied it until now because there's, so many, every, there's a camera in every pocket. And so these, these things are now being recorded and white people are shocked to see so many unarmed black people being killed by, by the cops. Black people are saying, we've known this forever, okay? We've been trying to tell you, now listen to it. You know, that's, that's what was fueling, is fueling Black Lives Matter and the black protests. And, and I, I hope that those protests are, go somewhere and listen to. But race is always gonna be um, a complicated issue in this country. And, and, you know, I didn't realize that 35 years ago when I started writing A Time to Kill, um, I knew that there would be a lot of racial conflict in the book because I was living in Mississippi in 1985 and the Ku Klux Klan was still around. Uh, they were not that active. They're still around now, but, but they, they were, were close by and there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, racial conflict back then that, that was, just not too, not too far under the surface. Uh, I, I think things have improved a little bit. Uh, things continue to improve. I look at improvement in race relations in, in this country by looking at my parents and myself and my children, three generations. Uh, my parents were the typical white Southerners, Southern Baptist, fundamentalist, uh, staunch, uh, segregationist, uh, the, we were, I went to white schools until I was 15. Our, our world was always gonna be white, no integration, no desegregation. That's, we, we had our white world and they had the black world and, and they would never, that's the way we, that's where we grew up. That's the way I, I was, that's how I was raised. And I, that's, we were all like that in the deep South. They're virtually all white kids. And my parents had no tolerance for uh, any minority of any, any kind. <laughs> They, uh, they had no tolerance for, and, and they were a product of, the, of their generation. Um, I was raised that way, and my siblings and I were raised in that environment, and uh, because we were able to get out of it and go to college and live a little bit, you know, we, we changed um, dramatically. Still struggle with where we came from, because once it's in your DNA, it's really hard to get it out to scrub it clean. But racism is still something that, that you know, I struggle with. Look at my kids uh, who are in their mid thirties. They, they don't get any of that. They don't understand, you know, why it was so difficult back then, why we fought integration, why we fought civil rights, why we, you know, why did you, you know, so those three generations have progressed tremendously. And, and, and I think the next generation will be even more tolerant and more, open and more willing to to say you know we're all in this together so um it's it, it's always going to be complicated in this country and um, you know what though i mean could I mean, as a fiction writer could you invent the attack on the capital i mean i'm not sure i would have dared to write that kind of scene the thing about fiction and you know this you can write anything in fiction but it has to be plausible 
<laughs> yeah. You can't, if you want, if you, if you, if you created someone like Donald Trump, a uh, politician, and as, as a fictional character, uh, nobody would believe it, first of all. It's not plausible. And uh, a man with, you know, all of his marriages and bankruptcies and deals and all this kind of, you know, no one like that could ever be elected president, okay, because, because of all of his problems, his history, you know, his, his dealings. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, how, how bad things are, but they, they, they appear to have to been really, really bad. Uh, a guy like that could never make it. A, a, a TV, you know, a reality TV star gets elected president. Um, I've been asked for four years, could you create something like this in Washington? And I always say, there's no way, there's no way. There's no way I could, none of us could predict what happened at the Capitol on January the 6th. I mean, the FBI couldn't even stop it. I mean, the, the police knew something was coming, but they were called asleep. They did not prepare for it. Uh, and but that's the power of the internet. Uh, these days, th things can get organized real fast. But no, um, I would love to write, a, I still want to write a big, thick political novel. Um, I've been saying that for 25 years, I'm probably getting further away from it, because <laughs> politics here is so unpleasant. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I don't know, I'll probably stay away from politics and stick to the law. It's something I, I you know, I, I, in, in Scotland, Scotland's a very small country with a very complex political identity or crisis of identity at the moment and I just stay out of it and I say if you want to know what I think about the world look at my novels um, they, they you know that's where I do my talking to the world and my making sense of the world um, and I tend to stay out of the political debates in the real world as much as possible because you can mostly only make enemies you're not going to make too many friends um, and also there's very little place for nuanced debate I find these days it's very polarized yeah. Um, in many countries now, many cultures, the, the, there is no debate. You're either with us or against us, your friend or enemy. Um, and partly that has stoked up what's happened here in the UK with Brexit. I mean, that was was um, saying that those in the, the rest of the European Union were the enemy, were different, were other. Um, and we, we had nothing in common with them and we had to mistrust them and we had to go off and do our own thing. And I, I just find that whole, it was very polarizing and very binary. And I just find it desperately sad um, that that's where we are. And it's, it's just, it's one more domino in this set of dominoes that are there. And Trump is yet another one of these dominoes, I'm afraid. You, you're right. You, you really have to watch your politics in fiction. Uh, you cannot assume that your readers share your political views. Uh, my views are probably uh, fairly easy to figure out if you read, you know, what I've written about the death penalty and about uh, mass incarceration and about wrongful convictions and all those issues that I enjoy writing about that, that because I care about them, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty easy to figure out what my politics uh, are. But I do face criticism occasionally from people who don't share those views but enjoy a good thriller. Uh, so, yeah, I'm always kind of walking I'm always struggling with how much, how much should I say? How bold should I be in taking a position? Um, what, what is expected of me or any other best-selling writer? Is anything expected? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's anything should be expected. Um, just do what we're supposed to do, right? Uh, you know, make movies, make albums, whatever, whatever, whatever you're supposed to do in popular culture, do it and keep your views to yourself. Now, that's probably the safest way to go. And that's, that's, that's kind of what I tend to do. I mean, I, I mean, you do get involved in projects that you're passionate about, such as Innocent, the Innocence Project. I mean, I know that. Um, so, you know, you will put your head above the parapet to that extent. But, you know, you bring up the death penalty. I was going to ask you about the death. I was going to ask you a little bit about it, but mostly just so I could say that I did once visit death row uh, in Texas, Huntsville, Texas. Um, where the death row inmates are kept before execution. I was making a program many years ago, a TV show, a documentary um, about evil, about the, the, the nature of evil, the concept of evil, what does evil mean, um, where does it come from and what do we do about it? And as part of that, I did get access to, to death row. It was an extraordinary thing because of course in the UK, we've not executed anybody since the 50s, the 1950s, I think was about the last one we did. Um, and 
ironically, if they put it to public vote, there are times when the public would say, yes, we would like the death penalty back, please, but politicians won't allow that, that vote to happen. Um, uh, so, yeah, I was going to ask about that because um, that and gun control, because the other thing we don't have in the UK is much in the way of gun crime, although it is a, uh, a problem in some of our cities, specifically London, um, young people getting access to, to firearms, but firearms are very hard to come by in the UK generally. Yeah. Um, and I guess my question about the death penalty would be, do, I mean, you know, under Biden, are we going to see a, it's going to be harder to execute people? Well, what's happening in this country in the last 10 years is the death penalty has been dying uh, rapidly, not even slowly, uh, not because of um, courageous lawmakers, not because of courageous judges, but because of courageous jurors, people on juries. Uh, we've, we've, we've changed the way we pro prosecute these cases in, in, certain, in certain ways in that nowadays the, the individual jurors, these are your average voters off the street who show up for jury duty, who, who have to show up for jury duty. Uh, they are, they get a better picture of the defendant and almost all of them are guilty. Uh, some are guilty of crimes that defy description, uh, horrible crimes. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, they are, their backgrounds are uh, revealed to the jury where they came from. Uh, most of them never had a chance in life. Most of them were abused, on and on and on, whatever the full picture is. Whereas used to, jurors did not see all that. And it, it allows the jurors, and every case is different, but the jurors um, are allowed to show some compassion for this individual who never had a chance in life, committed a horrible crime or crimes. And so juries now are opting to go with uh, no death, but life without parole. And so that's what's happening now in this country. At the same time, there's still a movement. My state here in Virginia uh, last month voted to end the death penalty. Uh, so that, that's slowly happening. I think we're now down to probably 32 states have it. Um, but of the 32 states, most are not what we call active death states. California is a death state. They have 600 people on death row. They've executed two in the last 20 years. They're not serious about it. New York's the same way. Uh, some states, Texas is very serious. I've been to Huntsville. I've been to the, de the death chamber. I've been to death row in Huntsville uh, researching a book. I've been to death row in six or seven states. And they, they're always you know, amazing places to visit. Uh, but, you know, I think with time, the, the death penalty will go away. We will still punish severely those who need to be punished, but with a small bit of compassion there to allow them to serve their time without killing them. You know, I tell people all the time, or I make the point all the time, if we can all agree that killing is wrong, why do we then allow the state to kill? And that's the, that's the one argument that is hard to counter when, you're, when you support the death penalty. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, that, that's, that's easy to write about. It's fascinating. Wrongful convictions, the innocence work is not really a liberal or, or conservative issue. Uh, at, the, at the Innocence Project, our, our mission is to, you know, we, I'm not sure, our, our, it's not a mission. We believe in uh, putting guilty people in prison and keeping innocent people out of prison. It's that simple. And that sounds simple, but it's not because we have tens of thousands of innocent people in this country who are in prison and some are on death row. And we uh, litigate in all 50 states to try to get the innocent people um, out of prison. Uh, about half the cases where we are able to get DNA testing to exonerate innocent people, that testing also leads to the real killer or the real rapist. So we're helping law enforcement do that. So again, the, the, these, are, the, these are issues that are just, yeah, fascinating to me and I'm sure I'll write them about them time and time again. Yeah I mean it's one of the things that you know when I go and look at the early Rebus novels the technology available to the police in the 1980s in the UK was just so basic. Um, I mean even things like DNA analysis weren't easy to, to get and it was very basic what you did get and sometimes I had to go off to a laboratory in Germany and could take six months before you got anything back and it might still not be conclusive. The changes have just been extraordinary. 
Um, same with stuff like technology with CCTV and everything else. Yeah. So I've got to be aware of that when I write the books now that all this stuff is available. Um, as you've said, the cell phone. I mean, you know, if you're being kidnapped now, just get on your cell phone and tell the police you're being kidnapped. End of story. Um, so as, as writers, we've got to somehow take that out the equation. Uh, oh, you know, I can't get a signal. Battery died. Oh, no. You see it in films all the time, don't you? Um, the reason I decided that I wanted to write about a detective, I've gone back to why you were asking me that originally, was a detective allowed me access to different levels of society. I thought a CID detective, a cop, could talk to the politicians and the bureaucrats and the CEOs one minute and the dispossessed, the disenfranchised, the people at the very bottom of the ladder another minute. And so I got, I could talk about a city from top to bottom, I could talk about a society from top to bottom, a nation from top to bottom using one character. And I just wondered, do, I mean, is that, you know, part of your reason for writing the books that you do? Is it to say something about society? Is it to throw up questions about the way the political world is, the social world is, social justice and injustice? And if so, I guess you find a lawyer a pretty good way of doing it. We see so much as lawyers. We see, we see, uh, we're involved in um, so many levels of politics. Uh, you know, so many, we have a hundred US senators. I bet, I bet two thirds are, are lawyers. Uh, when I was in the state legislature in Mississippi, 30 some odd years ago, um, more than half, this is a, a rural state, more than half of us were lawyers. Uh, so yeah, we, but there are all different types of lawyers. You know, you're lawyers in, in the big corporations, the big Wall Street firms in New York that I've written about gleefully, had way too much fun skewering those guys with several books. To the, to the small town legal aid lawyer who's you know working for a very low salary trying to help poor people. Uh, there's so many different fascinating levels of the law and, and lawyers who lawyers who work there. You mentioned technology. When I wrote A Time for Mercy, which came out last year, uh, I set the book in 1990 uh, to sort of deliberately stay away from technology. And we know life was pretty good in 1990. We had just uh, got our first car phones, not, not cell phones in our pockets, but we had car phones. And that was, that was pretty good. Uh, we still communicated just fine. My, my first book, The Firm, was published in 1990, well, 30 years ago, 1991. And, you know, that was in the modern era. We, we were able to publish back then, uh, long before the internet. When I was writing A T Time for Mercy, I cut on two occasions, I recall, I had Jake, my hero, uh, type an email. That's, it took me a few minutes to realize this is 1990. It's five years before the internet, okay? And at one time he had a cell phone in his pocket. I thought, no, nope, that's so. I mean, we are so spoiled to the, are so accustomed to the devices and the technology now. It's kind of nice to go back a few years, the 1980s, 1990s, uh, before all this technology. I'm overwhelmed with. Yeah, it's one one of the things I liked about taking my guy out of Edinburgh in the last book and taking him way up to the north of Scotland was that I knew that cell phone signal would be problematic. <laughs> Um, there would be no local police station. If there was a local police station, it would be unmanned. Um, it'd be locked up and you'd have to phone to get a cop. And how do you get a phone? How do you phone him when there's no phone signal? Um, so I was taking him out of his comfort zone and taking me out of my comfort zone and just making him work that little bit harder and possibly harking back to that simpler life. You, you do such a great job with the Edinburgh. I mean, the, the, your hometown is, uh, I feel like I know it very well. Uh, well, the whole country. I mean, this, as you said, this this one is uh, on the uh, the upper coast of. I'm almost finished. It's delightful. I'm almost finished with it. another your latest Rebus book. Uh, but the two things I love I love about your books are the, the plots. The plots are, are very very clever, and and the, the way the cops work, the the procedures, the interaction between the cops, because that's a foreign area to me. I'm not. I don't know about that. But also, I love. I love your, your local color, your, your, the way you write about Edinburgh, the way you write about Scotland, the countryside. Uh, you know, we're a, we're a long ways away from that. Um, our ancestors probably came from there, but um, you know, it's, 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 another, it's truly another, another world for us. And to be able to be taken back there time and time again with Rebus is, uh, is always a treat. And you just said you have a foot of snow on the ground, right? Yeah, we've got a foot of snow on the ground at the moment. It's still falling as far as I know. It's, uh, it's a late winter for us and it's a big winter for us. We don't always get snow in Edinburgh because we're on the coast, but we're getting it big at the moment. So no excuse to go outside. I've just got to sit in here and keep writing.
Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, the the I write about a real city, and in, in, in that is it, it has negatives and positives for me. In that I can't suddenly have things happen or invent places that don't really exist. I try and do my best to make it the real place. You've decided um, for for some of your books, not all of them, that you'll have this fictional uh, town in a fictional county. Um, and I guess you know there are probably uh, pluses and minuses to doing that as well. Do people say to you, "Oh, that's obviously"? there yeah oh sure and, and, and listen i'd much rather sell all my books there that's where i'm from that's where i uh that's where i grew up my families were from there it's it's the rural south it's a small town south in mississippi with all it's you know all the good and bad but i know um those people i know the culture the religion the politics the Food, the music, the you know the the conflicts, the history. Uh, when I when I go back there, and I, I was going to go back there all the time. When I wrote a Time to Kill, it came out in 1989. The firm came out 30 years ago in 1991. The Time to Kill sold 5,000 hardback copies. We couldn't give them away. Okay, the firm is you know sold a whole lot more. And so seven million, I, seven million and counting, young man. Seven million. And so um, the the. I realized, you know, maybe be maybe smart if I stick to the legal thrillers for a few years. And so I started, you know, I wrote another one, wrote another one. And before I knew it, the movies were uh, coming out, big movies with big cast and big productions. And, uh, you know, I, I, so I forgot about Forward County for a long time. And I was having far too much fun <laughs> with the legal thrillers and, and writing all different types of books about lawyers and politicians. And, you know, that was... And I, I'm, I'm not finished with that by any means. Uh, and I finally went back um, in 2013, uh, went back to Ford County with Jake Bergantz, our hero, for another big trial. And uh, it was, uh, we, we were sort of surprised, we were kind of surprised after being away for 24 years from Ford County with Jake. Um, we, were, we were startled at how, at his popularity among readers and it was, it was a combination of a time to kill and that movie and then also sycamore row but also because of the movie and because of matthew mcconaughey people just had a, this attraction to jake and the numbers for sycamore row were uh, very impressive <laughs> i thought okay well i'm not gonna go 24 more years before i bring jack jake back again and so i went about I went seven years and he came out last year in a time for mercy. And uh, again, it was very well received. And, and uh, it, it, the timing was, was uh, lucky because when Jay came out last October, a time for mercy, it, people just, um, he reminded people of an earlier time, pre-COVID back in, the, in those days when things were, seemed a bit simpler and and he stood for something they could understand, you know, a young idealist who's trying to do what's right and find the truth. And so anyway, I'm not gonna wait seven more years before I bring Jake back, but I've gotta, I gotta find another story. Well, I think there's, some, there's quite a lot of John Grisham and Jake, I think. Um, you, you know, this thing about writing about the real places versus fictional places, well, we've got a sort of holiday home, a place I sometimes go and write that's up in the north of Scotland, little fishing village. And, you know, for years they were saying, write a book set here, write a book set here. So I took Rebus up there for a book. There was a murder. Then they went, why did you have a murder happen up here? I mean, you know what kind of books I write? I mean, what am I going to have happen? A, a marriage? You know, a wedding? What? what a comedy? What? So um, listen, we're running out of time rapidly. One, can I ask you one more question, which is that I believe, well, at one time when you were interviewed, you said that your favorite author was John Le Carre. And I just wondered what it was about Le Carre that, because I'm a huge fan as well, and I just wondered what it is about Le Carre that you really liked. I was not, uh, I was not turned on by his early, the, the, you know, the first wave of books that made him famous um, back when he was still a spy. Mm -hmm. uh, the spy came, came in from the cold. Uh, uh, the spy, was, I, mean, I can't even think of all the titles. Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Smiley novels. Tinker Taylor, uh, Smiley's People. Yeah. Yeah, the small town in Germany. Yeah. Uh, th those are, I enjoyed all those books. And he published a book in 1980, uh, post-Cold War, uh, called Little Drummer Girl. Mm -hmm. And um, that book just did something to me as, as, a, as a reader. But a few years later, as a writer, 
it made me realize how how smart good suspense can be. Good, good, a, a great plot with really complicated characters and a complicated factual situation in a troubled part of the world. It, the, the book just hit everything perfectly. And I've read that book probably five times since 1980. My wife and I uh, last month discovered, we should have known this earlier, uh, the British TV series from about three years ago, Little Drummer Girl, six part series, or maybe it's 10 part series, mm-hmm. and a six part. And we watched that and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's all British cast and it was a uh, very well done, but that was one book that really just, you know, lit a fire at me. And then I, once I was turned on to him, I, re- I went back and read everything uh before and since um i thought the constant garden was a really good book mm-hmm. a pretty good film taylor of panama all, i mean all these books that he's he, he became my hero uh and we were gonna we were gonna uh, we we're gonna meet in london sometime pretty soon uh pre-covid and you know have a have dinner and and catch up and all this kind of stuff and uh he passed away last month uh yeah. at the age of 89 just uh too young to go. Too young to go. <laughs> yeah, as I'm, I'm in my 60s now. I'm starting to think that as well. Eight to nine is far too young. Uh, listen, we're going to wrap this up pr- uh, pretty shortly, John. Um, it's been, I've, I've not got through any of these questions. It's insane. So we're going to have to do this again, I'm afraid, so that I can ask you a lot of these questions. But I do hope that people have enjoyed the session. I do hope people will um, buy and enjoy our books, continue to, especially from New Dominion Bookstore. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean... I, I don't know. I mean, I hope this. I hope the pandemic doesn't go on much longer. But it seems to have been pretty good for both of us as far as getting some writing done. We're getting some. We're having to work. We have no choice. We can't go play. We have to work. We have uh, to work. So next year, 2022, you're going to be here in Virginia, live and in person. Okay. And I'm coming to Edinburgh for your festival too. Okay. What time? Yeah. What time of the year is that? Um, the Edinburgh Book Festival is in August when all the festivals happen. Um, so it's a really buzzing time. There's arts, there's opera, there's classical music, there's comedy, there's all kinds of stuff. It's an exciting time to visit Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, and there's no snow. If you come in August, I can promise you it won't be warm. It will not be warm, That's but great. there won't be any snow. It sounds wonderful. I'll yeah. see you there. I'll see you in Virginia. I may see you in Lyon, France at the next book festival there. Good, good to see you again. Très bien. Merci. Take care, everybody. Thanks, folks. Bye now.